from San Jose, in the heart of Silicon Valley, it's theCUBE, covering Big Data SV 2016. Now your hosts, John Furrier and George Gilbert. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live in Silicon Valley for theCUBE, SiliconANGLE's flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, my co-host George Gilbert, big data analyst at wikibon.com. Our next guest is Tendu Yogurtu. Yogurtuku, how do you say your last name? Yogurtuku. Okay, I got close. GM with Big Data with SyncSort. Welcome back to theCUBE. SyncSort's been a long time guest, one of those companies we love to cover because your value proposition is right in the center of all the action around mainframes. And you know, Dave and I always love to talk about, because we're all old mainframe, not mainframe guys, we know, we remember those days. And still powering a lot of the big enterprises. So I got to ask you, you know, what's your take on the show here? One of the themes that came up last night on CrowdChat is why is uh, enterprise data warehousing failing? So, you know, got some conversation, but you're seeing a transformation. What do you guys see? Uh, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, uh, yes, we are seeing the transformation of the next generation data warehouse and uh, the evolution of the data warehouse architecture. And as part of that, uh, mainframes are a big part of this uh, data warehouse architecture because still 70% of data is uh, uh, on the mainframes, world's data, 70% of world's data. This is a large amount of data. So when we talk about big data architecture and uh, making uh, uh, big data and enterprise data useful for the business and uh, having advanced analytics, not just gaining operational efficiencies uh, with the new architecture, and also having new products, new services available to the uh, customers of those organizations, this data is untapped. And uh, making that part of this uh, next generation data warehouse architecture is a big part of the <coughs> initiatives. And we play a very strong uh, role in this uh, bridging the gap between uh, mainframes and the big data platforms because we have product offerings spanning across platforms and we are very focused on accessing and integrating uh, data, accessing and integrating in a secure uh, way uh, from uh, mainframes uh, to the big data platforms. So one, of, one of the things, actually, the mainframe highlights kind of a dynamic in the marketplace around all customers, whether they have mainframes or not, but your customers who have mainframes, they already have a ton of data. They're data full, as we say in the cube. They have a ton of data to do it, but they spend a lot of time, as you mentioned, cleaning the data. How do you guys specifically solve that? Because that's a big, hurdle that they want to just put behind. They want to clean fast and get onto other things. Yes, we see a few uh, different uh, trends and uh, challenges. First of all, from the big data initiatives, uh, everybody is uh, uh, really trying to uh, either uh, gain operational efficiency, business agility, and uh, make use of uh, some of the data they weren't able to make use of before, and uh, enrich this data with some of the new data sources they might be actually uh, adding to the uh, data pipeline, or uh, they are uh, trying to provide new uh, products and services to their uh, customers. So when we uh, talk about uh, uh, the mainframe data, it's, uh, it's, it's really uh, how uh, you access this mainframe data in a secure way and how you make that data preparation very easy for the data scientists. The data scientists are still spending close to 80% of their time in data pre pre preparation. And if you come to think of it, when we talk about the compute frameworks like Spark, MapReduce, Flink, uh, versus uh, the technology stack uh, uh, technologies, these should not be relevant to the data scientists. They should be just worried about how do I create my data pipeline? What are uh, the new insights that I'm trying to get from this data? The simplification we bring in that data cleansing and data preparation is one, uh, we are bringing simple way to access and integrate all of the enterprise data, not just the legacy mainframe and the relational data sources and also the emerging uh, data sources with streaming data sources, the uh, uh, messaging frameworks, uh, uh, new data sources. We also make this in a cross-platform secure uh, way. And some of the new features, for example, we announced were uh, we were simply the best in terms of accessing all of the mainframe data 
and having this available on Hadoop uh, and Spark, we now also make Spark and Hadoop understand this data in its original format. You do not have to change the original record format, which is very important for highly regulated uh, industries like financial services, banking, and insurance, and healthcare, because you want to be able to do the data sanitization and data cleansing, and yet uh, bring that mainframe data in its original format for audit and compliance reasons. Okay, so this is, this is the product, I think, where you were telling us earlier that um, you can move the processing, you can move the data from the mainframe, do processing at scale and at cost that's not uh, possible or, or even e is, is easy um, on the mainframe, do it on, on a distributed platform like Hadoop. Um, uh, it preserves its original sort of way of being encoded, send it back. But then there's also this new way of creating a data fabric that um, we were talking about earlier where it used to be sort of point to point from the tra transactional systems to the data warehouse. And now um, we've basically got this richer fabric and your tools sitting on some technologies, perhaps like Spark and Kafka. Tell us what that world looks like and how it was different from. Uh, we see a, a greater interest in terms of the concept of a data bus. Uh, because uh, some organizations uh, call it data as a service, some organizations uh, call it uh, Hadoop as a service, but ultimately, uh, really an easy way of uh, publishing data and uh, making data available for both the internal clients of the organizations and external uh, clients of the organizations. So Kafka is in the center of this, uh, and uh, we see a lot of uh, other uh, partners of us, uh, including Hadoop vendors like Cloud, RMFR, and Hortonworks, as well as Databricks and uh, Confluent, are really uh, focused on creating that data bus and uh, servicing. So we play a very strong there, because phase one project for these organizations, how do I create this enterprise data lake or enterprise data hub? That is uh, usually the phase one project, because for advanced analytics or predictive analytics or uh, when you make a uh, change in your mortgage application, you want to be able to see that change on your mobile phone under uh, five minutes. Likewise, when you make a change in your healthcare coverage or uh, telecom uh, uh, services, uh, you want to be able to see that under five minutes on your phone. These things really require uh, easy access to that enterprise data hub. What we have, uh, we have a tool uh, called Data Funnel. This basically uh, simplifies uh, in a one click and uh, reduces the time for creating the enterprise data hub significantly. And our customers are using this to uh, migrate and uh, make, not, I would not say migrate, access data from the database tables like DB2, for example, thousands of tables populating and automatically mapping metadata, whether that metadata is Hive tables or Parquet files or whatever the format is going to be in the distributed platform. So this really simplifies the time uh, to create the enterprise data hub. It sounds actually really interesting when I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying. The first sort of step was create this, this data lake. Let's you know, put data in there and start getting our feet wet and learning new analysis patterns. But what, if, I'm, if I'm hearing you correctly, you're saying now radiating out of that is a, a new sort of a data backbone that's much lower latency that gets data out of the analytic systems, perhaps back into the operational systems or into new systems at a, at a speed that we didn't do before so that we can now make decisions or, or do anal analysis and make decisions very quickly. Yes, that's true. Uh, basically, operational intelligence and uh, batch analytics are converging. Okay. And in that convergence, well uh, what we are uh, basically seeing is that I'm analyzing security data. I'm analyzing telemetry data that's uh, uh, streamed, and I want to be able to react as fast as possible. And some of the interest in the emerging compute platforms is really driven by this, the, the use case, right? Uh, many of our customers are basically saying that today operating under five minutes is enough for me. However, I want to be prepared. I want to future-proof my applications because in a year it might be that I have to respond under a minute 
even in um, uh, sub-seconds. When they talk about being future-proofed, um, and, and you mentioned two time, you know, time sort of brackets on, on either end, are customers saying they're looking at um, a speed that current technologies don't support? In other words, are they evaluating some things that are, you know, essentially research projects right now, you know, very experimental, or do they see a set of technologies that they can pick and choose from to serve those different latency needs? We published a Hadoop survey earlier uh, this year in January. According to the results from that Hadoop survey, 70% of the respondents were actually evaluating Spark. And this is very uh, consistent with our uh, customer base as well. And uh, the promise of Spark is driven by multiple use cases and multiple workloads, including predictive analytics and uh, uh, streaming analytics and batch analytics, all of these use cases uh, being able to run on the same platform. And all of the Hadoop vendors are also supporting uh, this. So we see us, uh, our customer base are uh, uh, heavy enterprise uh, uh, customers. They are in production already in Hadoop. So running Spark on top of their Hadoop cluster is one way they are looking for uh, future-proofing uh, their applications. And this is where we also uh, bring value because we really uh, abstract that, insulate the user while we are liberating all of the data from the enterprise, whether it's on the relational legacy data warehouse or it's on the uh, mainframe side or it's coming uh, from uh, new uh, uh, web clients, we are also helping them insulate their applications because they don't really need to worry about what's the next compute framework that's going to be uh, 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 the fastest, the uh, most uh, 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 reliable and uh, low latency. They need to focus on the application layer. They need to focus on creating that data pipeline. Teddy, I want to ask you about the state of SyncSort. You guys have been great success with the mainframe. This concept of data funneling, where you can bring stuff in very fast, um, new management, new ownership. Um, and what's the update on the market dynamics? Because now ingestion's everything, multiple data sources. How do you guys view, what's the plan for SyncSort going forward? Share with the folks out there. Sure, uh, our new uh, investors, Clear Lake Capital, is very supportive of uh, both organic and inorganic uh, growth. Uh, so uh, acquisitions are uh, one of uh, the areas uh, for us. We plan to actually make uh, one or two acquisitions this year. And uh, companies with the products in the near adjacent markets uh, are uh, a, gr a real uh, value add for us. So that's uh, one area in addition to the organic growth. In terms of the organic growth, our investments are really, uh, we have been very successful uh, uh, with uh, a lot of organizations, uh, insurance, financial services, banking, and uh, healthcare, many, uh, many of the uh, verticals, very successful with helping our customers create the enterprise data hub, integrate, access all of the data integrated, and uh, now uh, carrying them to the uh, next generating generation frameworks. Those are the areas that we have been partnering with them. The next is for us uh, is really. Uh, having streaming data sources as well as batch data sources uh, uh, through the single data pipeline. And this includes bringing telemetry data and security data uh, 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 to the uh, advanced analytics as well. Okay, so it sounds like you're providing a platform that can handle the t today's needs, which were mostly batch, but the emerging ones, which are streaming. And so you've got the sort of future proofing that customers are looking for. Once they've got that, those types of data coming together, including stuff from the mainframe that they want, might want to enrich from public sources, what new things do you see them doing? Predictive analytics and machine learning is a big part of this because ultimately uh, uh, once there are different phases, right? Operational efficiency phase was the low-hanging fruit for many organizations. I want to understand what I can do uh, faster and uh, serve my clients faster and uh, create that operational efficiency in a cost-effective, scalable way. Second was, what are new go-to-market opportunities with transformative applications? What can I do uh, by recognizing how my uh, telco customers are uh, interacting with the self-service help and uh, how 
like under a uh, couple of minutes, I react to their uh, um, uh, responses or self-service is the second one. And then the next phase is that, how do I use this historical data in addition to the uh, uh, streaming of data rapidly I'm collecting to actually predict and uh, prevent uh, some of the things. And this is already happening uh, uh, with, uh, like, uh, uh, with banking, for example. Uh, uh, it's really uh, with the fraud detection, uh, a lot of predictive analysis uh, happens. So uh, advanced analytics using AI and advanced analytics using machine learning will be a very critical component of this uh, moving forward. This is really interesting because now you're honing in on a specific industry use case. Um, and something that, you know, every vendor is trying to sort of solve the, fr the fraud detection, fraud prevention. Um, how repeatable is it across your customers? Is this something they have to build from scratch because there's no templates that get them 50% of the way there or 70% of the way there? Uh, actually, there's an opportunity here uh, because uh, if you look at uh, the healthcare or telco, or uh, financial services or insurance verticals, yeah. there are repeating patterns. And that for fraud? Uh, for fraud or some of the uh, new use cases in terms of uh, uh, customer churn analytics or uh, customer statistics. So these patterns and the compliance requirements in these verticals creates an opportunity actually to come up with application uh, uh, applications for new companies, uh, start, for new startups. Okay. Tendu, final question. Share with the folks out there the view of the show right now. This is 10 years of Hadoop, seven years of this event, Big Data NYC. We had a great event there, New York City, Silicon Valley. What's the vibe here in Silicon Valley here? This, this is one of the best events. I really enjoy uh, Strata San Jose, uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, the uh, uh, two days of uh, uh, keynotes and uh, hearing from colleagues and uh, networking uh, with colleagues. This is really uh, the heartbeat happens uh, because uh, with the Hadoop World and Strata combined, actually, we started seeing more business use cases and more uh, discussions around how to enable the business users, which means uh, the technology stack is maturing and the focus is uh, really uh, on the business and uh, creating uh, more insights and uh, value for the businesses. Tendu, you go to welcome to the cube. Thanks for coming by. Really appreciate it. Go check out our uh, Dublin event on uh, the 14th of April. Hadoop Summit will be in Europe for that event. And of course, go to SiliconAngle.tv. Check out our Women in Tech. Every week we feature Women in Tech on Wednesday. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks for sharing the insight with Syncsor. Really appreciate it. Thanks for coming by. This is the cube. We'll be right back with more coverage live in Silicon Valley after the short break. Thank you.